Great. Uh, so thank you for joining us, Chris. Uh, Chris is our CTO, and he's the guy who came up with how most of this works. And he's going to walk us through how to look at tickets and kind of the process behind them, some of the logic behind um, how to solve tickets, and just in general, how you can save time by looking at the report with each ticket. Yeah. So first of all, uh, this is what the report looks like. Um, now, there will be a link to the report in every uh, ticket system as a private note. So whenever a ticket comes in through the Tier 2 ticket software, uh, a private note will be appended to that ticket, which will link directly to a report like this one. Uh, the first thing to notice is that along the top of the report, there are categories with different flags on them. We have network, software, hardware, and security. And so these will be red or yellow or green, depending on whether or not any errors or warnings were found in those categories. And if we scroll down a little bit, you can see uh, if we collapse this, these are the actual categories and you can expand them to go into more details. But before we get there, the main information in the ticket uh, is the problem description. So this is gonna match what is actually in your ticket system. And of course you'll have a copy of this in your ticket system as well. So this is actually what the user typed as to what their problem was. And then down below you have some information about the user, their email address, uh, you even have their computer name so that you can uh, connect to their computer. And these are the various check boxes and radio buttons that they selected whenever they were uh, going through the, the software to put in the ticket. And this big screenshot here is a screenshot of what was actually on their screen at the moment they launched the software. Uh, so maybe they launched the software by pressing the button, or maybe they clicked the link on the start menu or the um, taskbar. But at that moment, right before the software launches, you get a screenshot. And if you click on the screenshot, it's a little hard to show in this, in this one, but maybe you can see it better in one of the other ones here. There's a little play button um, on the screenshot. There we go. And if you, if you click it, it will load a animation of what was happening on the computer screen at that time. So it's scrolling through what the user was doing. This is before they actually trigger the software. So this is always recording. And whenever the user clicks on something or they type in certain keys, then it takes a snapshot and it appends it to this little slideshow you'll see. So you can actually see, you know, you can go back and see exactly what they clicked on. Uh, and it actually has a little annotation here on the slideshow and you can flip between the different frames. Uh, you can even download individual frames uh, or you can download the entire video. If you do that, then uh, you know you can share this information with vendors, uh, and it makes it very uh, convenient to be able to reproduce the problem in the future or to see exactly what the user was talking about. I mean, often you'll get tickets to say something like this program's messing up again, and you know you don't know what program they're talking about or what messing up means. So you can go back and review the slides and see, oh, they were using Outlook and it gave a specific error code, and now you can see what the error code was and cut down on ticket resolution time like that. Another thing you'll see here on the side, we have, uh, this is a, a more itemized list of the same information that's at the top. Now these are also links. So if you click on this, it'll jump to the software section, but also along the side here, these are links to that specific thing in that software section. So if we go here, uh, there's DNS cache results. Now DNS cache results, we put it under security because what we're actually doing here in the DNS cache is we're looking through every domain that they have visited recently, uh, regardless of if they have cleared their browser history or not, it's still going to be in their DNS cache. And we're comparing them with, with Cisco Umbrella, and then we're categorizing things that are potentially harmful um, by flagging them in this report. So uh, you can see in this in this slideshow, this, this person was, if you didn't catch it, they were trying to watch a free copy of Avatar online. They installed some Chrome extensions. And now you can see, you kind of get a, you know, a flag about something. One of the sites that they visited were potentially uh, malicious. All And all of these link to different parts of the report. So for example, RAM usage, you have the full list. This is a breakdown of all the processes that were running on the computer at the time when the button was pressed uh, or, the, or the software was launched. But you also have, you know, a flag saying specifically this one you should, you know, pay closer attention to because of the processes here, uh, this one was the highest on memory and this one was the runner up. Uh, and so if they're, they were complaining about something that may be memory related, 
then uh, you know these are the first processes you want to look at as culprits. And let's just go through the individual things one by one in the report. Because again, you've got stuff that's flagged, but let's just talk about some of the stuff that's in here. Uh, you know, information comes in even when it's not flagged. Uh, as much information as we can gather is always in the report. And you know, we flag the stuff that we think may be problematic, but all the stuff is there all the time. So you've got land packet loss, for example. Now, everyone's familiar with using the ping tool. Um, if you ping a domain and it, by Windows default, pings four times, and one of those uh, pings don't reply back, then you have a 25% packet loss. Uh, now, in this case, the, the land packet loss is determined by, if you come down here, you can see it, uh, you can, it's by pinging um, a few different IP addresses, specifically the one that, that uh, we just consider packet loss in general is if we ping 8.8.8.8 and there's packet loss on that, uh, then that would get flagged. Now 8.8.8.8 is Google's DNS server. So you can generally expect that if 8.8.8.8 uh, .8 .8 .8 is down uh, or is, is not responding correctly, it's not Google's fault, it's probably your internet. Uh, and that's the similar, similar situation. Oh, I'm sorry, that was, that's for WAN packet loss. Um, and so that's probably a problem with your internet. For LAN packet loss, we determine LAN packet loss by pinging the IP address of the router. And uh, specifically it's this, it'll be the same IP address that's down here as the gateway IP. And so if you can ping, if you can't ping your router, you'll know about it. If you, if you can ping the router, but you can't ping Google's DNS, you'll know about it. We have Wi-Fi signal strength and Wi-Fi security. Uh, signal strength is, you know, again, they're not on Wi-Fi. This user was connected directly to a, to a network. Uh, cable, but if they were on Wi-Fi and you see that the you know they've they got a low a low signal strength, then you know that the packet loss is probably related to them just being too far away from the access point, or maybe the access point is having problems. Uh, Wi-Fi security is just uh, it's it's the field that will tell you what kind of encryption type is being used on the wireless access point. So you know as a general rule, currently the best option is for us to be using AES, um, but you know some people still have WEP set up and web is broken and so uh it is not it is not sufficiently secure for modern networks so if web was in use then you would see wi-fi security would say web and it would be highlighted in red as a as an issue you know an ssid is just the wi-fi uh access point name uh local ip is of course their their ip address of their uh computer that we are pinging to the gateway from uh, latency is, that is how quickly the ping came back. Uh, I should point out though, that when we are pinging these IP addresses, we're not just sending four pings, uh, like the windows default, we're actually sending, I think it's more like 20 in a short amount of time. Like, uh, I think it's a couple of seconds. The WAN latency is going to be the average of those 20, 20 pings. So you're going to get a much more accurate and averaged out latency than if you had used the four pings from the default uh, windows ping tool. Now, WAN latency, you know, we'll flag that if the average is above a certain amount, but we also flag that uh, you've got the average, which is that one. Um, and then you also flag the, uh, the maximum latency, uh, potentially the minimum latency and jitter. So maximum latency, again, we sent 20 pings. We've got the average. Uh, one of those pings, the, the one that took the longest to respond back is going to be the one that's in the max latency for that field. And uh, minimum latency is the one that responded back the, quick the quickest. And jitter is kind of a combination of uh, minimum latency and maximum latency. Whenever you have a network that is kind of all over the place with how quickly uh, packets move around, where some packets arrive very quickly and some packets take longer, then you inevitably end up with packets that are out of order. And whenever a packet arrives out of order, then it has to be retransmitted, which causes the, the service interruption. Um, now with TCP, that's not a problem because TCP handles retransmissions fine. But if you're using voice over IP and you have, you know, those, those happen over UDP for the, um, the audio channel, then the jitter is very important. And we actually flag jitter uh, yellow or red, depending on the recommendations for Cisco's uh, voice over IP phones. So if you're seeing the jitter is in a warning state, your users might be on the verge of, of having issues with sound quality on voice over IP phones. If you don't use voice over IP phones or any have any services that you're using that are very sensitive to jitter like VoIP, 
then it's probably not a big deal. Even very, very poor jitter is not usually a problem with TCP. And most services are using TCP besides video and audio streaming. Uh, maybe gaming is another thing, but you, know, you wouldn't typically see that on a business network. And so you've got primary DNS suffix. Now that's going to be uh, the primary DNS suffix that's set uh, either by DHCP or in the network card. So local domain in this case is what the router set it to whenever it got DHCP. But this would normally be in, a, in an Active Directory network, the, the fully qualified domain name for the Active Directory domain. And actually, if we find that the primary DNS suffix is a fully qualified domain name, we add that to the network diagnostics table. Uh, we, we also ping the domain controller so that you can make sure, you know, your router's working, your internet's working, and your domain controller is responding correctly. And in fact, we take that a bit further on, in places, whenever we do a DNS lookup uh, to do a DNS test, we do a DNS lookup of the primary uh, DNS suffix. So we, we, in it, we do it basically the equivalent of an NS lookup uh, for whatever your domain name is. And if multiple DNS servers respond back, in other words, you have a, an Active Directory domain with multiple domain controllers, then we actually ping each of those domain controllers as well. And so they'll show up in this network uh, diagnostics list. And so you might end up with something like, you know, a dozen uh, IP addresses that we're collecting all this latency uh, and packet loss information on uh, in this section. The system clock, if we hop over, this is an older version report I'm showing, but if I show here, we've got the system clock. It just shows how many minutes off the system clock is from time.google.com. Uh, the reason this is in the network section is because, for one, we are uh, using NTP, uh, Network Time Protocol, to test if the time is off. But we're also, you know, whenever you're doing, uh, trying to diagnose network issues, a very common network issue is that uh, every website you go to has an invalid SSL certificate. And the most common problem uh, that leads to that is that your system time is off. And so, uh, you know, this will tell you if the system time is off and that can of course be a problem sometimes. The Windows firewall status, I don't think we flagged this, but it's there for, for you to check. If, if in your environment, the Windows firewall should be off, then now you know it is and you can confirm that. If it should be on, then you'll know that as well. Oh, here's an example of the NS lookup results. Uh, in this case, the that was the domain name. And so it did a NS lookup on that domain, which uh, for for Google.com. So it sent this is this is the DNS server for this computer. So it sent a request to the computer's currently set DNS server to, to ask what IP address is Google.com. And so those are the IP addresses that it responded back. The reason this is useful is. If you're in an Active Directory setup, you are obviously using your own DNS server. You're not using one of the publicly available ones like 8.8.8.8. Uh, so it's important not only that you can uh, ping the DNS server and, and you would know if you couldn't from the network diagnostics up here, but it's also important that the DNS server is actually responding with sane results. Uh, so you can have a DNS server that is reachable, but the DNS service is in a failed state. And so whenever we do an NS lookup for Google.com, it doesn't respond, for example. And that would show up here and it would be flagged if that were the case. Uh, map network drives is just a list of the network drives on the computer, as in, you know, you've got the Z drive linked to a specific network share somewhere on the network. Oh, in this case, you can see that they actually weren't on an Active Directory domain. Uh, they just had a primary DNS suffix uh, so that might actually be a problem. Maybe they should, uh, shouldn't have that DNS suffix. Uh, you know, in some situations, here's where they were actually on Active Directory domain. And you would want to make sure that the DNS suffix actually matched in that case so that you can do name resolution to computers on the domain by, without having to type out the fully qualified domain name. And so that's, of course, useful information to have. The rest of the stuff, if we uh, continue on, we've got CPU usage, which is pretty self-explanatory. Now, again, this is a, a snapshot of the time when the software was launched. Uh, so if it seems high or if it's in a, in a spike state, it's because that's just one moment in time. Maybe something was happening at that moment to cause it. it but if you see it running at, in red, it's 100% CPU or something like that. You can, again, scroll down to this process list and see what exactly was causing it. Uh, the disk IOPS utilization. Uh, this is something that a lot of people aren't familiar with. That stands for 
IO operations per second, uh, IO is input output, whether it's an SSD or a hard disk, whenever Windows says, I need you to go get some information from the disk, it has to send it as a request and the disk has to go process that request. You know, generally you've got, uh, you know, the window says to go fetch a, uh, some information at a specific block for like a file. Let's say it's trying to read, you know, any, an executable that the user clicked on the computer. So what has to happen in that case is that the disk has to go fetch the contents of that executable and then pass it back to, to the operating system. When it does that, because obviously the, the disk is a finite resource, it can't go get, can't process every request immediately. So it has to, it has to cache that stuff. Um, so if it gets a bunch of requests for uh, a bunch of different files that come in at a, in a short time, it queues them uh, and then processes them one by one. Now, the IOPS utilization is basically how full that queue is. If the queue fills up, uh, if, if it's been asked for more things off of the disk than, are, you know, than, are, than can be fetched in a reasonable amount of time, then that queue will fill up and Windows just cannot read from the disk until that queue is empty. And all the processes are on the computer just sitting there waiting. And so if IOPS goes to 100%, then the computer's frozen. And, and the computer's frozen because the disk did not respond quickly enough. Now, maybe this is a problem with the fact that you've got some kind of piece of software that's going haywire and thrashing the disk, asking for either writing to or reading tons and tons of data or you have a failing hard drive and it, you know, maybe it's not getting an unreasonable amount of requests, but it's just too slow to process the requests in a reasonable amount of time. Uh, so if this is high, then, you know, whatever it is, if there's a performance problem, the bottleneck is the disc. So that's very helpful for determining where to look. Uh, you know, people generally think whenever they think about the computer being slow, they're looking at the CPU, they're looking at the memory utilization. Maybe they're looking at the internet, but if the computer is slow and the disc utilization is high, then it's none of those. It is the, the hard drive that's the problem. Uh, system volume size is pretty self-explanatory. The system volume is, is the C drive, and that's how big the C drive is, and this is how much free space is on the C drive. The OS version, if you click on this, uh, it goes to more information about it, but it's telling you the version of the operating system that's installed. And if you click on it, it'll take you to you know, what's new in that uh, version of the operating system on Microsoft's website. OS install date is pretty self-explanatory. The date Windows was installed. System uptime, that's how many, that's how long the, the computer's been turned on. This will flag red if it's been on for, uh, or maybe it's yellow, uh, for more than a week or so, you know, because you generally want to reboot at least somewhat frequently, especially as software and the operating system gets updates. Uh, you often need to reboot for those updates to finish their installation. Uh, browser information you saw earlier with the problem with one of the people's computer was their Chrome and they installed a, a malicious extension uh, while trying to watch Avatar. Uh, this is helpful for those kinds of situations. Uh, you can take a quick look and see what's up with their Chrome, what's installed on it. You can see the default browser is set to Chrome in this case. Maybe in your environment you want it to be set to Firefox and you'll know if that's not the case. Um, this real-time process list, by the way, uh, besides showing you uh, the IOPS for each individual process, which of course is very useful whenever you see that this is too high, you can come here and see which process it was that was thrashing the disk. But you also get a list of all the process names and each of these links to information about that process. So you're going to, you know, you can, if you don't know what the, the process uh, name for a specific process is, or you, you don't recognize what that is, if it's malicious or not, you'll know about it uh, by, you know, just clicking on it. And I mean, for instance, your phone, what is that? You know, it sounds like it's some weird malicious thing. In fact, it's actually uh, built into Windows 10. But even for things that are malicious, uh, you'll, actually, you'll actually see them in, uh, in the list as well. Um, and we, uh, and you'll be able to get information about how to remove them and things like that. The application, you know, this is the event viewer application log. Obviously the event viewer is full of tons of information. No one ever looks at it because it's so overwhelming and it's got a ridiculous amount of information and it's often very cryptic and hard to understand what they're even talking about. Uh, there are, and it's got tons of logs and like which one are you even supposed to look at? There's two main logs you want to be looking at. That's system and application. There's other logs in there. They're generally not as important. But even just looking at those two logs, you still get tons and tons of log entries that are just super noisy, hard to understand what's going on. 
uh, what we do here is since, you know, we know that the problem happened shortly before the moment that the user launched the software, because that's why they, that's why they're contacting you is because the, uh, they're having a problem. Uh, we know that the information in the event viewer that is most relevant are those things that happen most recently. So we flag things that occur within 10 minutes, errors are flagged as red and warnings are flagged as yellow. So these three things are the application entries in the event viewer for uh, errors and warnings that happened within 10 minutes of the button press. Similarly, system uh, warnings that happened within 10 minutes of the button press or errors, which there are none in this case. But you know, again, the stuff is super cryptic and, and ridiculous uh, to try and understand half the time. So we've added these links in here. And if you click on them, they take you to uh, the, the most prominent place on the internet where they're discussing this issue. And so oftentimes uh, that is the uh, official TechNet forum where somebody has had that problem. But also it often leads to uh, KB articles directly from Microsoft itself with the symptoms of the problem and the cause and, and how to fix it. And so that's super useful. Uh, it takes all the, the mysticism out of the event viewer and puts it at the forefront. When I not necessarily, these aren't necessarily the reason that the user put in the ticket, but if they were, you would be able to tell pretty quickly and you would pretty quickly find a resolution uh, to that problem. Uh, blue screens of death, I don't have any to show, but they show up similarly in the, in the list. So if there was a blue screen of death uh, within the past week, then you will, in this list, get a very similar thing. You'll get the actual information that the blue screen uh, had, and then you'll get a link to the official Microsoft KB article about that blue screen error. Those are actually always going to be the official KB articles. Each one has a breakdown for the cause and uh, potential reasons for it and, and what to look for to remedy the situation. Uh, the system stability score, this is, a, this is a number created by Microsoft. It's kind of hidden inside of Windows, but you can get it manually. But what this is, is basically, it's like a ratio of how often programs that the user is interacting with are frozen uh, or crash while they're using them. Uh, that'll flag in red. I'm not really sure what the range of the scores are, but if it's if it's above a certain threshold, uh, then we flag those in red, and that means that the user has been um, not having a good experience with the computer. You know, a large percent of the time, their their applications that they're using are frozen or crashing. Uh, generally, that number is not useful by itself, but it tells you, you know, to, you need to look at other issues. Um, specifically, if we see, uh, you know, one of those flagged in red, that usually means that the computer's old. Um, that's the reason it's freezing. It's just an old computer with a platter hard drive, and they're trying to use software on it that it's not able to handle. Uh, and so that's a good thing that you can take to the user and say, look, it's probably time to upgrade this computer. Or, you know, again, it's, maybe it's having some kind of hardware problem and, and you would have uh, information about those kinds of hardware problems in this report. Specifically, you know, like I said, this tells you the score for how often applications are crashing. This will tell you the actual applications that are crashing. Uh, so you'll get like a time and, uh, and what application name, you know, says that Chrome crashed at this time or whatever, which uh, you know, sometimes is a, a big giant list of, you know, applications that have crashed recently. Hardware, uh, this is just, a, some of this is just a general overview, like for instance, the model of the motherboard and video card, the fan status, that's, you know, if you if you stick your finger in one of the fans uh, and stop it from spinning and then hit the thing, you'll see one of these says that it's, uh, it's faulted. So it tells you if the fans are spinning, which is useful. Obviously, if the computer's cutting off randomly and you see the fans are in bad shape, then you know it's overheating. Battery discharging, this is most relevant on a, on a laptop. Uh, so, you know, if, you, if they have a laptop, then it will, um, and, and they don't have it plugged in, then it's going to be true. Uh, but it'll also show up on, you know, uh, servers. So if you're, if you're running this on a terminal server and you see the battery is discharging, then you know that the power is out and they are running on a battery backup. That's probably not, not good. And then, of course, the battery charge will tell you how much, you know, is left of the battery. And in this case, this doesn't have a battery, so it's not really cool. The BIOS release date will be flagged in red sometimes too. Specifically, if the BIOS hasn't been updated in several years, uh, I think it's like five years or something, then we flag those in red. Generally, just because uh, one, the BIOS 
being up to date increases system stability, but also because the BIOS is five years out of date, then the computer itself is more than five years old. So it's, it's probably time to look at replacing that computer. Uh, recent Windows updates. Uh, these are interesting because, you know, besides seeing which updates are installed, which are not particularly useful at a glance, nobody knows what these crazy KB numbers mean uh, besides Microsoft, unless you visit their article. But in situations like this, where they're flagged as red, it's because, and again, and also, I don't know if I pointed this out, you can put your mouse over the things that are flagged in red to get information about why it's flagged in red. But uh, you can see this, this is flagged in red because the last security update was installed more than 90 days ago. That means this computer hasn't had a security update in two Windows uh, update release cycles. Now that's a problem because they are now exposed to some kind of security vulnerabilities, whichever ones are most recent. And, and you know that's, that's never gonna be the case unless something's wrong with Windows update. So that's something to worry about. You'll also get these things flagged in red sometimes if there was a very recent update, which is kind of funny, it's like the opposite, you know, in this case, we're saying this is a problem because it was so long ago, but we'll also flag it if it was very recent. That's because, um, you know, like let's say it was installed yesterday, it would be flagged in red just because often when Microsoft releases a, an update, the, it breaks some kind of compatibility with different types of business software. So if you've, if you had a very recent Windows updates and or Windows update installed and the user is complaining about something on the computer, then there's a non-trivial chance that the problem uh, is because of the Windows update. So we flag those as well. Um, storage problems. This will, this is the results of a smart uh, test. So you will get uh, things in this category when uh, the disk is failing. Specifically, uh, the C drive, if it has bad blocks, uh, if uh, Windows, you know, sometimes uh, there's a predictive failure on hard drives that works some non-zero percent of the time that tells you when the hard drive is going to fail soon, you should back up your data. When that happens, uh, it bubbles up a message to the to the end user of the computer and a little notification pops up uh, in Windows and tells them that, but they, they probably don't take that seriously. But if that pops up, it also shows up in the event viewer and we're able to see it uh, for this report. So we pull that information, we flag in, in, in red as well. So you'll know if Windows knows that the disk is about to fail or if it has any bad blocks, uh, you'll know about it as well and it will be uh, flagged as red. Hardware device errors are specifically anything in the device manager. Oh yeah, here we go. Here's an example of a storage problem. So um, this is the kind of this is the kind of message you would see with a storage problem. Uh, and then hardware device errors, anything that shows up in the device manager of Windows uh, with an exclamation point or or, uh, or a red X on it would uh, would show up in the hardware device error section. And like many places in the report, you can click it and it will take you to information about uh, about that error um, and solutions for how to how to fix it. The printer status, um, it just tells you if there are jobs in the queue or if there are job errors. Uh, this is useful if you know the print spooler is in some strange state, you'll be able to tell by looking there. So specifically the Windows experience rating, that's the number that would show up uh, in the uh, about computer section in Windows 7, or you can still see it in Windows 10 in some places, specifically if you run the WinSAT formal command, it will test your video card, your RAM, uh, your CPU, your hard drive, and basically give you, uh, well, you could, uh, that probably wrote a report somewhere, but it gives you the uh, slowest of those as the, um, uh, the rating. So it gives you just a general idea of how quick a computer is. And if it's below a certain threshold, uh, six specifically, then we flag that as a possible, uh, maybe too slow computer, too slow of a computer uh, for a business environment. And, uh, you know, if it's below, I think, uh, two or so, then it, we flag it as red, uh, that make it a very old computer and probably needs to be replaced. Uh, the hardware warranty, I don't have a computer that has um, a hardware warranty on it, but uh, it'll just tell you if how much longer is left in the warranty or if it's, uh, it's, if it's out of warranty, it'll be flagged as red as well. Uh, security, we went over DNS cache earlier, um, but over here we also have the antivirus status and that will tell you any antiviruses that are uh, installed on the computer will show up in this list. 
which is very useful for if you see multiple antiviruses and you see that two of them are enabled. I think we flag that. Um, you obviously don't want two antiviruses competing with each other. Uh, so if the real time, this is specifically the real time protection engine, uh, the, not the scheduled scan. Uh, so the real time protection engine of two antiviruses is enabled and that's a problem. Or if you have no antivirus enabled at all, then that's a problem. And so that information is there as well. And if you look here, you can see that the email security section, this is actually a list of websites for which the email address shows up on haveibeenpwned.com, uh, which if you're not familiar with, is a huge list of all of the biggest security breaches that have happened you know, ever. So it includes like different times that Facebook has been hacked or different times that other social networks and different things have been leaked to the public. And those things often contain uh, passwords to the account which was registered with that email address. So if your users are like many users are reusing their password, so their password for uh, in this case, Zynga, I guess, is the same as at their bank or their email, you know, then, uh, then whoever has access to li this list, which is anyone on the internet, uh, also has that password and can log into other accounts belonging to that user. So specifically, if you see this stuff come up, then you want to tell the user, and, you know, and you can see these are highlighted in yellow because they're recent. If, they, if it was very recent, it would be highlighted in red. But you, you can tell the user, um, hey, your, your email address came up on a, on a uh, list of, and your password was leaked to these accounts. Are you using this same password uh, with other accounts that we need to lock down? You know, um, if, we need to, if you need to secure, uh, you know, various business services because the password is the same, then you can reach out to the user and, and know about it. And if you click on these, uh, like you saw, it actually links to uh, the information about the incident and when it was leaked and you know how how bad of a problem it was and so that is the that is the report in its current state is there anything that you wanted me to go over elizabeth uh that, that i missed no I, I mean i think that was a very thorough walkthrough um some of those features the the warranty feature it's coming in our next version um we're continuing mm -hmm. to add reporting yeah, yeah, like a lot, half the stuff didn't exist a year ago, um, and so as we uh, build out new new things, then uh, they will they'll show up in the report, and uh, you know some of it might require an update to the software, but you know the report will continue to work, you know, for the old versions as well. That's wonderful. Thank you so much for going through all of that, Chris. It's really really good. I hope it'll be really useful for our, our folks. Yeah, you're welcome.